Random walk can be used as a type of procedural generation technique. It is perfect for generating caves, tunnels, rooms, paths, islands, or similar geometry where you want a continuous path for the player to follow. It can do a lot of things, and we can go from a very basic implementation that yield highly random results to implementing biases or weights to create a more uniform, albeit random generation. It's used in various fields from engineering, ecology, psychology, computer science, physics, chemistry, biology, economics, and sociology, etc. But I'm not gonna pretend to understand random walks at any deeper mathematical level. I'm just a game dev. What I do know, however, is how to use it for things like procedural generation. And I'm guessing that's why you're here. So, I will try my best to explain, show some graphics and examples, and then we will move to my 3D random walk Unity project that uses voxels and octree partitioning to see how you can make it slightly more advanced using weights and biases. And we're also taking a brief look at GDQuest's procedural generation archive for Godot and their version of the random walk in 2D. It may be weird of me to show someone else's work, but it's a fantastic resource that I want to bring attention to. And we're just gonna take a peek. No doubt you already know of GDQuest. Regardless, you will find the relevant links to everything we talk about in this video in the description down below. So first off, we have a walker. Now really this is just a point in space, typically a snap to some grid position. We can visualize the walker here as a cute penguin. The walker's job is to randomly move around the grid from position to position and place tiles, or at the very least remember the positions that it has touched. Starting off, we place a tile right where we are, or in some other fashion mark this square as walkable, and then we move. One of the benefits of using a random walker is that the tiles are always connected. Because we have to walk to every single tile, it means that we are guaranteed that they are connected. Typically, you move in one of the cardinal directions, so left, right, up or down. So let's move up one step. When we arrive, we place a tile just as before. And just as before, we have the same random choice of moving. But really, we don't. Because we just came from one of those directions. So we only have three. This is one of the problems of the walker. Not that we can only move three directions, I mean, that's fine. But we never want to traverse a tile that we have already been to. There are multiple ways of handling this. But we need to check that we don't move back to a previously explored tile and only step onto new tiles instead. We'll come back to this. Now we can walk around like this, stepping randomly in any direction, placing tiles directly, or storing the positions that we have visited for later. You can use only one walker, or you can summon more over time, to all walk around. We will soon reach one of two situations, however. The first is that the walker walks into itself. I like to think of this as the walker collapsing, and it's not uncommon for this to happen. Essentially, the walker walks in a small circle and gets itself surrounded by previously visited tiles. The second situation is that the walker reached the bounds of the map where it's not supposed to go, or maybe it even collapsed against the edge of the allowed bounds. How do we handle this? Do we stop the simulation? Typically, the random walk will run in a while loop. We have a maximum value of tiles that we want to place, and the while loop runs until we have placed the desired amount of tiles. Getting stuck like this is catastrophic. There are a few common alternatives. One is to clone the walker. Essentially, walkers that end up in this position will destroy themselves when this happens. But on good tiles with multiple opportunities, it will split into several walkers, and you have some maximum amount of walkers that can be active at any one time. Another solution is to teleport to an untouched tile. As we move about, we could collect information about the surrounding tiles and store them in a list or something similar. When the need arises, we can teleport to a previously scouted tile that we know is unoccupied. Yet another, perhaps simpler alternative, I suppose, is to move back to a previous tile and just move from there. Lastly, after we have moved through all the steps we wanted and generated our tiles, we can now start to worry about everything outside of what we just generated. Every empty space next to a spawn tile could be a wall, for example. On a grid, to find all the surrounding positions, we typically perform a nested for loop. Here is a, quote, standard nested for loop for iterating through a 2D grid. We have a loop for each axis, in this case that's two loops, one for x and one for y. For each row of x, we run y amount of times, until we reach the bottom column. So for each tile on our grid, we can run this create neighbor method. Let's focus on a single tile in the middle, and iterate through all of its neighboring positions, starting at our current x, minus one, and our current y, plus one. This puts us at a diagonal to our top left, the loop will only run three times, starting at x minus one and reaching x plus one. For every x, the y loop will run three times, filling in the columns from minus one y to plus one y. For each x, we run through all y positions in that column. 
The first and third columns are all neighbors, but in the middle one, we will come upon our own position that we probably want to skip. One way of skipping it is to add an if case checking if both values are zero, then just continue. We also want to make sure that we haven't already visited this position. Again, to make clear what we're doing, we are looping through all eight neighboring positions to a single tile, and we check all empty positions. What do we want to do here? We want to place walls at these positions. Now we can run this check neighbor method for each visited tile. That means we will visit each neighboring tile and turn those into walls, or whatever it is that we want to do. Now that we understand what the random walker does, let's move to a real world example and its code. This project is rather large and has a few niche features, but we're not gonna deep dive into all of that. I will just focus on the random walk part. Let me briefly explain how this is set up. I did not create this with the intent of making this tutorial so it's not as neatly organized and commented as you might hope. This is a project I was working on, and I haven't had the time to come back to. We generate positions using a random walk algorithm. We feed those positions into an awk tree that subdivides the space into smaller and smaller partitions. And lastly, when we are done, we draw voxels at these positions. The idea was that instead of a Minecraft world, where all voxels had to be placed beforehand in large chunks, this would only place voxels in the areas that it touched and the player would then make the world bigger by digging and adding to it. While working on it, I realized that I could do what I call an inner and outer generation. So the positions that we generate can either be drawn as voxels, or everything else could be drawn as voxels. And everything inside these positions would just be empty space. I started working on procedurally placing objects in these worlds around the time I abandoned it. I am mentioning this to drive home the point that this is not a perfect example. Normally, I would create a new project just for this video. But since I have this lying around, I decided we would use this, even though it contains so much more than we need. Anyway, now we know what we're looking at. This script, Voxel Generator, is responsible for, as the name implies, generating voxels. There is a lot of code in this Voxel Generator script, but the random walk part is fairly short. I will single it out as best I can and keep everything else out of view. First up, just like in our previous example, we keep track of our current location. This is just an empty transform that I'm moving around. In fact, you don't need a physical walker at all, just a vector three to represent the position. Next, we need to remember all of the positions we visited. So save the position in a list or a hash set. Next, move the walker one whole step in any direction. Double check that your new position doesn't already exist in the list. If it doesn't, then move and just repeat this process for as many times as you'd like. But now we actually need random directions in 3D. In this method, random walk direction, we randomize between zero and six. A cube has six sides, and so there are six directions for us to travel in, now that we're working in 3D. We use a switch and simply return the random vector result. This is really everything we need. Choose a direction at random to take a step in that direction. Add it to the walker's current position and voila. Now you could have the walker be its own entity, with its own code and autonomy walking around. But for this project, there really isn't a walker at all. It's just a concept. I am just moving a transform by one in a random direction. This walker can move in any cardinal direction. It randomly selects a direction, moves the whole step in that direction, and places another voxel. It repeats this process until it is finished. And by the end, we have generated a 3D point cloud of voxels. I mentioned before this common problem in that it will sometimes wrap around and walk back into itself, collapsing. So we need to do some error handling to make sure it doesn't try to occupy the same space. This includes asking the oak tree if we have already placed a voxel at the desired location. If we have, we will try another random direction a few times. I have a max number of attempts. If we can't find a new position after trying this many times, it is likely that we have walked into a pocket of already filled positions at which point we need to teleport out by just selecting another previously explored location and continue from there. I have complicated this somewhat by adding biases. This is a way to control the randomness of the walk to some extent. This will be a bit more complex, so I will try to simplify as best I can. The random walk direction has a chance to instead of returning a random direction, instead return from another method called radial bias. In here we compare the dot value from the center of the world where the random walk started and return a vector from that center. We then create an array of six floating point values, each representing the dot value between the direction from the center and any given cardinal direction. 
The dot product measures the cosine of the angle between two vectors, effectively indicating how aligned they are. The highest dot value will be the closest aligned direction. In layman's terms, we are checking which direction the walker can take that would take us towards the center, and we select that one. So every once in a while, instead of completely randomizing a step, the walker will take a step in a certain direction, in this case towards the center of the world. This could of course be used for a lot more. For example, we could add a bunch of positions in the world that the random walker has to reach, where it would have a strong bias towards these positions, and not stop generating until it reached them. But right now, I'm using it for two purposes. In a cave-like world, I want to add a radial bias to ensure the random walk walks away from the center, branching outwards. In an outside world, I want it to generate inwards towards the center, creating more of a large landmass in the center of the world. Finally, for you Godot heads out there, let's take a look at a public resource created by GDQuest. Following the link down below, you will find not just a random walker, but a slew of different procedural examples that you can take a look at for both Godot 3 and 4. The random walker example project included looks like this. It generates rooms by following a random path. It then fills in the rest of the cells with random rooms. The rooms that it creates with the walker are guaranteed to be connected and unobstructed. The rest of the map is completely random. This is the kind of procedural generation technique used by games like Spelunky. We're not just placing tiles, we're placing handcrafted parts of the map. Let's take a look at the code together. And I will be pointing out parts of the code that by now should look familiar to you. Starting off, right at the top you see this constant, step. This holds the possible directions for the walker. There is a reference here to the different rooms that can be placed, the grid, and so on. In the ready function we see a call to generate the level. The generate level function starts by resetting everything to zero. It then picks a random starting position along the first row. Until the path is completed, it places rooms, moves to another position and repeats. Finally, it places the rest of the generation. After everything has been placed, it emits a signal which starts the game and spawns the player. There are surely other projects out there that you can look at. And now that we know the basics of how they work, we can make use of those resources. Well, there you have it. The random walk as used in game development. Now this is certainly not all there is to know, and I am certainly no expert. I have just tried to condense as much as possible into this video. I hope you found this useful, and thank you so much for watching. I have read many of your positive and encouraging comments, and it really means a lot to me. Let me know if there is anything I missed, or if you have suggestions for certain content that you would like to see in the future. I also want to apologize for the poor state that the Unity project is in. You can download and rummage through it if you want. If it looks interesting to you and you want me to keep working on it, let me know. Right now I am more focused on content for the Godot engine. I hope to see you in the next video. Like I mentioned earlier, it will be about tree data structures, mainly octrees. Take care and have a great day.